I'm Chris Bryant, CCIE number 12933, and welcome to the Cisco certification training video where we're going to take a look at trunking. We're going to discuss the theory of trunking, and sometimes in production networks, we really don't have to do a lot to form a trunk. Sometimes if we plug in the right cable, everything's going to happen automatically, and we really don't have to think about it. But we all know for our Cisco exams, especially the CCNA exam, we better go a little beyond that and really know what's going on with a trunk and why we need to create one in the first place. So let me bring up a quick diagram from the website, actually. And here are just a simple example. You can call this a trunk line or just call it a trunk, if you will. But here we have hosts in the same VLAN, but they are connected to different switches. And of course, this is really what it's going to be like in the real world as well. So we've got to allow our switches to communicate and send frames to each other. And that's really what a trunk is all about. Now we've got a couple of different protocols that we can use with today's Cisco switches in order to form trunks. One is ISL and the other one, the full name is IEEE 802.1Q, but you're going to see it probably referred to on your exam simply as .1Q and that's how people usually refer to it in the real world as well. There are three main differences between the two, and we better know these differences like the back of our hand. First off, ISL is a Cisco proprietary trunking protocol where .1Q is the industry standard. And as I note here, those of you relatively new to Cisco testing should get used to the phrases Cisco proprietary and industry standard. Here, just to mention here, if you're working in a multi-vendor environment then, ISL may not be a good choice. And even though ISL is Cisco's own trunking protocol, their proprietary trunking protocol, some Cisco switches only run .1Q. You don't even have the option to run ISL. ISL also encapsulates the entire frame. And this really does increase the network overhead. And we're always interested in keeping unnecessary overhead down. .1Q only places a header on the frame and in some circumstances, one major circumstance actually that we'll talk about in a moment, even that header doesn't get put on. So really, there's much less overhead with .1Q as compared to ISL. And this leads to the third major difference, the way the protocols work with the native VLAN. The native VLAN, all it is, is the default VLAN. And sometimes I'll talk to a student and he'll say, well, we don't really use VLANs. We just, you know, plug the thing, plug the switch ports up and we're ready to go. Even if you don't think you're using VLANs, you are because you're using the native VLAN or the default VLAN, which I'll show you just in just one moment. On Cisco switches, that native VLAN is VLAN 1. Now with dot one q frames that are destined for the native VLAN, they don't even have that header added to them. So that's even less overhead when that remote switch receives a frame with no header on it, it says, oh, okay, this must be for the native VLAN. That's with dot one q The problem with ISL is that it doesn't even understand what a native VLAN is. It doesn't understand the concept of it. So every single frame going across that trunk is going to be fully encapsulated. It's going to have a header and a trailer put on it, and that's a lot of overhead. As I mentioned, we always want to bring up the live equipment whenever we can. So that's what I'm going to do here. And we're going to take a look at a couple of Cisco switches. I have two Cisco switches here that I have connected via a couple of crossover cables. And they're both 12 port switches. And whenever you sit down for the first time at a switch, maybe you go out in the field and you need to see which VLANs are being used. I like to use the show VLAN brief command. You can use show VLAN, there's certainly nothing wrong with that, but you do get a little more information than you're generally going to need. And if you run show VLAN brief, I'll show you the difference here. I'll use my up arrow and just type in brief here. You'll notice that we get a lot less information. Frankly, this is really all we need. And you'll notice that VLAN 1 is the default VLAN. It's even named default. And I'm going to scroll over a bit and show you the ports that are in that particular VLAN. And right now you can see that ports Fast Ethernet 0, 1 through 9 are in VLAN 1. So that's our native VLAN. We're seeing everything we expect to see. But I mentioned this is a 12 port switch, so where are those other ports? If you see or don't see port numbers here, they're probably trunking. 
and I'll show you a great command just to see which ports are trunking and it's simply show interface trunk and this is the information that you get and you can see up there at the top we have three interfaces that are trunking 10, 11, and 12. They're in dynamic desirable mode which means they're actively attempting to form a trunk with the other side. We're using dot one q encapsulation the status is that they are all trunking and note that the native VLAN is VLAN 1. So this is a great command to see which of your lines are actually trunking and on this particular switch model of 2950 we don't even have ISL as an option. So note that even though ISL is Cisco proprietary it defaulted to 802.1Q and again that mode is desirable. So that's a good thing to keep your eye on whenever you run show VLAN brief people tend to say wait a minute you know I'm missing some ports here what's going on well the only thing that's really going on is those happen to be your trunk ports and that's a really good place to get started as far as your trunking goes you can see what the mode is which ports are trunking what the encapsulation is that's the uh, trunking encapsulation protocol what the status is and the native VLAN that's all there is to it so that is your review on trunking and again, switching theory, I want to give you just a word of advice here because that's the first thing you really get into in your CCNA studies if you're studying uh, the ICND2. But when you first look at it, it's really the first big topic you have during your CCNA studies. And it can seem a little overwhelming at first. My advice to you, just break your studies down into smaller, more manageable parts. And sooner than later, you're going to see those magic letters CCNA behind your name. And there really is no better feeling. I want to invite you out to some webinars that I'm running, some free frame relay webinars and other topics too. We're going to run Ether Channel webinars. We've got a lot of great free webinars coming up. Just come out to www.thebryantadvantage.com slash ccnawebinars.htm and the registration forms are right there. Also, I invite you out to the website where we've got over 275 free tutorials, videos, practice exams, all kinds of great stuff. And Microsoft Server 2008 certification material is on the way as well. Thanks for taking a few minutes to watch this video. I'm Chris Bryant, CCIE number 12933, and I'll see you at the website.